Okay. Um, now the last part of this conversation conference today. At first, a big, big thank you to all of you. It was so interesting and it was such a good mix and it really showed quite some facets of the work of Michel Magirus. And I mean this, Cory, you are here, right? I, I am here. <laughs> <laughs> I've chosen not to be 10 feet behind you, so I will just be here in audio. Oh, okay. it's good. It's, it's a bit like God watching from here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but good, I just wanted to know before, you know. So it was, um, I would like with this last panel, I would like to wrap it up a bit. And I would also like then open it to the audience for last questions. And since Motoko, I'm gonna start with you because we didn't have any questions um, for you and the Q&A. What I found interesting, I thought about Michelle and also Japanese cultural history when I saw the show at the estate with Murakami and Majerus curated by um, curated by Tobias Berge um, uh, from, the, from Hong Kong. And he was really interested because for the first time I realized it and I knew that Murakami also didn't know Michelle very much. Could you tell us a bit about your approach towards his work? To Murakami? Um, ne, Majerus. Uh, Majerus. Uh, uh, I, so I went to Slate the painting and I just discovered Majerus's work. I go really into it and it's for me like um, in the um, talks, we kind of talked about like he's not somehow outdated and still you can kind of have this like conversation like right like now like his styles and like econo like the use the way of um, using images and so on so um, I just kind of really when I was like doing BA I was really inspired like really painting can be anything like open pop fun <laughs> and and your performance also the, the two performances you showed here today yes how, how do you connect it? Uh, how do I connect it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so he's, he, I, I thought that he's, he's, he used like a Mario Kart or these pop images, which I think the way that he, see, he, I thought his style was new back then or like unusual or something, but I feel, I felt the character or the way he used or the, the character themselves were already probably nostalgic for him as well like probably this um, rabbit or Mario, these, like maybe he wasn't, maybe like that, I don't know. I think he had a mixture of like iconologies back then, but also like his more older date, like this like a uh, table game kind of like symbol. So I thought for me, this karaoke is kind of always like a nostalgic thing. <laughs> and, so and also, this is also a question to Corey from an artistic practice. I mean, we talked a lot about performance today. Mm -hmm. And you both, I mean, you did a performance. Uh, Corey, I think you also, you called it lecture performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is, what, what makes the performance aspect of, of Michelle's work interesting? Or is it rather the painting? I mean, I find him utterly performative. Yeah, I agree. I also think that the work is is a, works on a performative meta level. I don't think of him as a painter really at all. Um, I don't, I'm not even sure. I think installation artist is also maybe a bit too limiting, but I think that it's, he's performing as Majerus as he, he's, he's, all, I don't want to say as a character because that's not quite it, but He's really aware of what it means to be a painter and to have a name. And I mean painter in quotes, but to be a painter, to have a name and move through the art industry. He's, he's so aware of it. 
that it, yeah, you could argue it is a performance. Although uh, when you start using the word performance, people think there's people clearly, you have to kind of qualify because people think someone's standing around doing something in the gallery. Oh, okay. I will say uh, over and out when I'm done. <laughs> Do you also have an answer to this, or is it was it for you more the painting aspect of his work? Mm, not not painting, but more like how digital or the way, like the the images or techniques he used. Wow, mm -hmm. my, my question, like all the time, like when I look at his works, like how I don't know, like new it was, or like. Mm. And do you see a connection to Murakami? Um, some parts of it, yes, the way, like a flat images. Um, yeah, but Murakami is more, I think, pushed the anime kind of side, like, yeah. But I think Majira is more like connected to history of painting and the like styles of like abstraction expressionism, like folk and stuff. Like yeah, I mean, I mean, he's really, he's really in between. I see him yes. also as a type of an artist that is now completely contemporary and yes. there. And he started, I mean, coming from the painterly 80s in a way yeah. in, in Germany and then changing something <laughs> in his own practice. Yes. But when we talk about, I mean, when we talk about or having a panel like this, it's also about history building in the end. I mean, we all the time do it. And most of the most effective is 100 years after an artist died, in a way, because that's the easiest, and you see the big picture. Mm -hmm. And we are trying it also here today, also with, 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 uh, with the talks. There was a lot of, of thinking about what he would mean today or what he meant uh, in a way. So can, can I ask a question about the relevance today of Majeus? Is there somebody who wants to answer? I mean, you answered this already. Um, <coughs> and I think Corey also answered it in a way. Is there something that can be made of use for today's art practice, for today's curatorial praxis, was is really, really important in a way? I guess I can take that one. Um, I also wanted to just start by saying that I, I personally don't find Majeros' work as performance. I think it's performative, but I don't think it's performance. And as, a, as someone who works with performance, I think that the use of the body and performance practices um, comes with its own history and is incredibly important as a history unto itself. So curatorially, I would make a distinction between that being a performative painter or performative artist, but I don't, I don't see this as being performance myself. I know that Bart van Heide, for example, has written about his performative character, and Corey has spoken about that, but I would um, politely disagree. Um, but in terms of his relevance today, I think that, that what's been a little bit the elephant in the room that Fabian uh, kind of, uh, you know, talked about, and this gentleman in the back <laughs> that's the Luxembourgian artist, um, or, or there was also someone who was asking, okay, but like, what's the political merit of the work today? Mm -hmm. And it kind of feels like um, there's a ticket to entry in the art world right now in terms of it needing to be political. And I think that that begs the question, what is political art and what is it doing and why? And I think that what is really interesting about Majeros is that his politics is embodied. You know, it's not something that he's making a declarative confrontational statement about many things, but he has a politics that is kind of existing within the, within the kind of body of his work. Um, it's in his production practices. Um, and I think that that's interesting to look at. I think that that's a huge discussion point right now of how do we look at works like this? How do we look at someone who has also a very internal practice, an internal logic, one that's um, you know looking at a sometimes problematic history of a very male-dominated history as well? Um, but how do we make sense of that? And also, is there room 
in an industry for this kind of work that doesn't necessarily have a very clear political stakes when we need to make so much progress on a social front. Um, so yeah, I see it as a huge discussion point. Um, and I guess I would push back on the idea that his work has to be contextualized within you know, the sphere of politics. Mm -hmm. Fabian, do you wanna <coughs> add on this? I mean, you also started the discussion on politics in his work. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, yeah, but yeah. I I think it's interesting what what when Corey talked about the perception of the work, um, or like his very kind of personal approach to the work, and then we looked at this one favorite painting of his with all the text elements amongst others burn out. I think there's an element in it which we which often is perceived as like cool statements, but like then this is an aspect that I find super interesting if you would like dig deeper into this meaning of of the actual words used. Um, and this I find, I find like, I find it, a, I know what you mean with there is this kind of like need in the, in the art world today that everything needs to be political somehow to enter, but then this kind of curiosity that he had in looking around, adapting, using, mixing, um, trashing it, reusing it, and again, I think this kind of curiosity is, is something that I find highly political on one hand side, but then also just human in nature. Um, yeah, I think that's the relevance. I mean, it's interest, interesting, Tim Neuger just pointed it out, that, you know, it's political and non-political. It's, um, ah, now I, I forgot about the best, best part you said. It's, you know, it's, it's performative and it's not performative. It's painting and it's discussing painting in a certain way. So, you know, it's both. It's, there is a certain complexity without choosing without choosing the direct path, but also accepting and respecting the, um, the uh, complexity of it in a way. Yeah, maybe to, to add to that and to also like the, the this performance discussion uh, we had here, um, I'm also not necessarily thinking there is this kind of like performance within the work, but like if you would look into the history of, of performance art as such and just use the term of performance as something that kind of like opens up a very kind of um, stuck art world in the 70s, 80s. Performance was the medium that kind of like brought together suddenly all kind of different areas from the visual arts, from dance, from music, from literature and so on in a kind of radical manner. And this kind of like, if you, if you use that term to apply it to material, then I think there is this performativity based on that idea of mixing suddenly visual languages from all over the place. There's another question that, that popped up the whole time, and now I remember what Tim else, what else he said. It was, on the one side it is dystopian, if you really look at the language, and on the other side it's extremely light. Um, and I never had this dystopian, I never saw this dystopian <coughs> aspect in the work so much. Um, but uh, Corey, maybe you wanna say something about this? Yeah, it's... <clears throat> Excuse me. It's it's interesting because I had exactly the opposite. I I never saw the work as light at all, and, and it's only today that yeah, there was mentioned there was a kind of light criticality in one of the presentations, and so it's only today that I've even been introduced that his work is light. Um, I mean, maybe, um, yeah, I. And, and why is that? I mean, maybe it's because my in was the later work, you know, and that is the work that I actually saw. Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, just the phrases in that painting, you know, the means of deception, there's something about detonation. I mean, it's, we're really talking about explosives, um, 
you know, deception, war, um, fire. So, so yeah, I, I'm I'm very thankful for this day today because now I have to re- I have to revisit everything and think. Well, maybe I'm not even seeing a whole half here. You know, uh, over and out. <laughs> I always thought his works were light to me, but you know, like I don't. It was for me like when I saw his work at the first time. I was like, oh, this is really so accessible, so familiar because of images, cartoons. Like you feel like I mean, you feel the vibe of '90s or something, but like you still like feel like ah, oh, my generation's kind of painting. Like you know, grew up with games and things like that so yeah and if i may just add to that because i think um it's very interesting that you say you felt very familiar with it i myself had to um google google image reverse search some of the uh pictorial elements because i i first thought i would recognize them as we said often like techno font or something like that but i didn't actually know where it comes from i didn't really know what it was and it, and it was quite a bit of forensic work from my side to to uh, retrace it. And I found that it was actually interesting to, um, <coughs> to see how there's this, and that's why I brought up this term of the cultural unconscious, there's this feeling that we, we are familiar with something like the Bussy Bear or the Super Mario or whatever, and we have, a, it looks friendly, but then there's also a sinister side to it. So I, I do definitely see what, what Corey mentioned. I think um, the ambiguity is, very much um, there is like there's multiple levels of um, alienation, but also being alienated from something that you're sort of enclosed in, right? Or that you're immersed in. Um, and I think that's that's something that um, the the work really it crystallizes in the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say actually I feel like it's uh, the works are all like a, a mirror. And it's really, I think, it's really not um, so much a layer where you would go into depth and analyze certain strata of images, but I think their their relevance and also why they can fill this topic. It's it's exactly how you are looking at them that is sent back to you, and I feel because of this cultural and conscious aspect, maybe it is why it is so present, but not in a light way, in a way that if your time is a dark one, you are going to see that directly, and you are not, and you are going to have your guard down, because you think it's something eternal, it's something light, it's something pop, it's something universal, so you are not really going to see an image that is connotating, oh, this is this and this reality I'm living in, or this is political art, and I think the fact that it's not showing that it's either political or light or speaking about this or that. Mm. It is this moment when you have your guard down, then actually if you are living in an optimistic time, if you yourself have this vision of the world, this is what you are going to see. And I think for me it was something that became very clear when we were all doing our presentations, because I felt they were all very much more personal than what you would usually have at this kind of symposium. And I guess it's really you are just, it's like a mirror held up to everyone and every time. Yeah, I think I think this is a very, very good point because also today I looked, <coughs> I looked at all the presentations and I had this feeling of really Berlin, also a mirror of Berlin of the time and it was political and it was light and it was techno. And I found so many things I wasn't aware about but it felt like a completely familiarity with what was happening at that time there, and it's really, um, yeah, I also I agree. It is a certain mirror of something that is um, that speaks to, to, to many people like, like on a very, very personal level. I, th- I keep thinking about the fact that um, I find uh, Majeros' work quite reticent. Like as a maker, I think that in I know that's like a million dollar uh, English word. It means like hesitant to speak. Um, And I I also find it to some extent, um, him as a maker quite anonymous. 
And I'm wondering, we haven't really talked about authorship and his relationship to authorship. And we've talked a lot about this idea of sampling and how he acts almost as like a filter. And I wonder if that's a, a, an intentional strategy that he has to kind of remove himself as a kind of, you know, in this very German painterly male way to remove himself as this kind of character as a maker and to use more of this kind of function as almost like a sieve uh, within his work. But I don't know, I mean, I also talked to, you know, Tim a little bit about the fact that he was quite an introverted person. You know, the talks that I've seen him give that are on YouTube, you know, he seems like very hesitant to make these kind of grand pronouncements, you know, and that all of that um, thinking was in this, uh, the format of these notebooks, which are so incredibly crucial to understanding his thinking and his work. Um, but yeah, I guess authorship really popped up for me in terms of um, thinking through uh, his, his kind of methodologies and strategies just as we've been talking right now. Can I, can I pass this question on to Corey maybe? I mean, I'm, I refer also to your presentation and the mix of different references to you brought into this presentation. Corey is really the person who made me think about this because it's also within his presentation. You know, Corey, you were talking about how he, um, you know, would appropriate the styles and also even like directly the work, right, of like Warhol and Basquiat, and that takes quite a really unique personality to be able to just, you know, it's it's very like cheeky on one hand and it's also very, um, um, you have to really kind of not have an oversized ego to be able to do that. But yeah, I'm, I'd be curious to hear Corey's thoughts on that as well. I mean, yeah, I agree with, it's, it's wild. I mean, I think some of the things he did are absolutely to, to have, I mean, I, I could speak from my own experience as an artist, there's a, but like, if I were to try to do some of the things that he did, I would feel almost ill, like <laughs> trying, like the day of the opening, I would feel kind of sick in a way because they're so nervy, you know, and they require such an, such a, an amount of confidence, right? And, you know, it's, it's mystifying to me that he was able to to do some of these things like yeah the warhol basquiat thing with the lines i mean uh it's it's nervy it's it's intense and it does make sense to me that he had a kind of rich introvert life you know because i think i think otherwise you would it just seems hard to imagine in terms of authorship i mean yeah it's hard i don't have a great take on it other though than during those years in symposiums like this, which I was uh, had started to get invited to, there was always this idea of the remix, which kind of always drove me nuts. You know, like everything was a remix, everything was mixing. Um, so the only thing that I would say is it might be interesting to go back and look at some of those ideas now and see if there's anything worth salvaging from that kind of dialogue, you know? Um, because of course you could, you could see how easy it would be to apply something like that to Majerus, but I wonder, I wonder really what was happening, you know, during those years. Like what, what really? Anyway, so that's a kind of non-answer, I would say. Okay, but 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 over I'm, and out. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm insisting uh, because no, I just have another thought about this authorship part. Isn't it also the question of what you are dealing with? I mean, if we look at, at Warhol, Warhol also played with authorship and he used also all these commercial images, signs and what so on. And um, Michel also when he used the, the Nike sneakers and, and so on. And, and you as well with Pac-Man and um, all the other figures you took from these gaming uh, gaming sphere, I mean, do you have? Uh, isn't it also like um, the moment you take and you remix? Isn't it a different authorship in a way? 
Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess, of course, I think it's good that you're pushing on me a bit, because, of course, I was doing this in exactly these years, <laughs> you know, so I should be able to answer it. Um, I mean, for me, it's, uh, it's material, and he used both material, like logos and things like this, but also artists as material or entire artists or, or entire movements. And um, it, it's... Yeah, it's simply just another material, really. I mean, that's how I looked at it then. And it's a it's a, another material, but it's also another context. So when you when you take do something with a video game or take something with a video game, you also have to wrestle with how that is perceived in the world. And and you have to wrestle with what it means when you bring it into the context of fine art. And so he, of course, was aware of all of this, you know. So there's a lot, there's it's maybe a bit more than just than reauthoring. It's 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 like a what do they call like a three six three hundred and sixty degree um, shift when you when you use these items and then drag it into the fine art world uh, and and you could even see how I misread it when I was a young artist and I should have been I should have been the person who exactly knew how to read it you know so it's complicated. Um, yeah, but I think what's unique also about his his kind of uh, sampling or references is that you know in comparison to Warhol, who was appropriating from the commercial sphere, Majerus also brought in art historical moments and painters and directly took certain painters' work alongside pop media, and that requires a certain sense of humility, <coughs> I think and also confidence, as Corey said. No, it's great. Yeah, and, and they're related. They're, ex they're, they're, exa you, they're exactly the same thing, humility and confidence, ego, and, and um, you, you can't have one without the other. I mean, it's interesting, in Zen Machine is this big installation we're also going to show next year. It's like we, we have Kraftwerk, we have an abstract painting of Gerhard Richter, and we have the test image uh, of German TV um, during the night. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting mix uh, of, of references, but it shows pretty well that contemporary, contemporary narrative uh, uh, of that time. There's another aspect I was thinking while especially listening to Sarah's and Ingrid's talk today. I haven't thought about Virilio for a very, very long time, but it came up, um, especially I was thinking of the book, the year 2000 uh, will not happen. I just know the, English, the German, the German um, title, so I think the English title is different. But it is also um, for me, he was a very fast artist and there was a certain pace in everything and this pace also informed um, his artworks in a way or that's also why these artworks look like they like they l made, turned into their specific look. Do you have, uh, Sarah, could you again talk a bit about acceleration, about the acceleration uh, part? Sure. Um um, I think somebody uh, earlier asked that question about the, the uh, way of production in the studio to Fabian, and um, maybe I, I can add to that um, from speaking to uh, Bastian Krondorfer, um, who he worked with, or who worked with him, with my years in the studio, um, and specifically talking about this pop as terror um, series of paintings, he mentioned that they would um, paint sort of against each other, like to see who, who could do it faster. And this was actually part of the, of the um, practice, right? So this was, it was like a strategy in order to produce these kind of paintings and to make them, as you said, look the way they look. Um, and I thought this was interesting also when thinking about um, this question of animation and how, how you bring this like flow or this idea of flow into this two-dimensional painting plane. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would probably pass the Virilio question on to you because I know that have had been referenced quite often um, by critics, but then on the other hand it said um, 
or I read that uh, Myers himself would uh, reject the um, references to acceleration or speed. Um, although, of course, we see it a lot in the, you know, the letterings and everything that he uses, but they're also taken from a cultural underground that was obsessed with speed. <laughs> yeah, I also find it complicated because for me, Virilio is very rooted in a certain university and academic French lineage. And if you add to that, that it has been mistranslated and it's only through mistranslation that it has entered more pop cultural spheres. Uh, I find it very difficult, but maybe uh, what I could add, add uh, to this question uh, would be maybe less about speed than about a certain texture of anonymity, which I think go together. And maybe the fact that the paintings and the imagery appear so smooth, and to me, smoothness is correlated with speed, in a way. It's also because um, you have this very 90s idea, which is anonymity, which will become collectivity afterwards. But it's still about dissolving oneself um, in this texture. And it's a bit the, the way why it's interesting to me that he's also still a painter, where I could just have been a collage artist or like if you want to follow this strand of speed. And I feel it's a way of how do you remain a subject while still uh, being conscious of existing in this sphere that is pushing you toward anonymity. So I feel that there is still actually an attempt maybe not to go with the speed, but retain a little bit from that. And this also has to do with this idea of paranoia that I was speaking about in the fact that for me the fact that he is painting is a question I was asking myself why did he need to paint because his images don't need that it could have been the same with collage for instance and I feel for me it's really there is this aspect of not going crazy and you need to understand why where you are and the act of painting and when you see him in his studio and he was a conscious studio artist I feel that there, there, there is this double edge, actually, and trying to remain someone painting in a certain frame of reference while still acknowledging the speed and the multiplication and the fact that he is remaining anonymous but still performing. I mean, it's totally interesting that he's touching so many buttons. It's like, I also, I would say, yes, it makes completely sense. For me, he's in a, in a painterly tradition. When I look at the history of painting, for me it's totally clear. But on the other side, there are people who not like Corey, and maybe also you, why did he do painting? Corey says, I don't see him as a painter. I mean, this is also, this is like the complexity he's, he was based in. And what I also like, I'm, I'm jumping now, is um, that, that you turned to the Berlin Biennial. It is so interesting. For me, it was the last really interesting Berlin Biennial. There were many interesting works in the other ones as well, but as a statement, and it was not a very successful one. A lot of people didn't like it. But there is a certain culture, there's a certain digital culture, culture that was played out. And nowadays, we have a culture where painting is completely important again. I mean, look at Paris International, was was almost only painting. You know, it's. Um, I think this is also the, the complexity he was dealing with. Yeah, it's a bit, I mean, we were speaking very briefly about this, but I think it's also something that's reverberating a bit in all the, in all the intervention. I'm thinking especially about yours, Fabian, saying that you need to be time specific to look at his work, and it's a bit what he's learning us as well. I think that the fact that we are living in harder times today, it's a bit why we turn to, to painting maybe as a frame, but smaller paintings and things we can maybe more control because the Berlin Biennale it was maybe the last moment where there was still enough hope to indulge in this kind of practice. So, yeah, that would be my... Um, yeah, to, do, to add to this... I mean, 
I agree. It was the kind of like in its form as a biennial, it was probably the most radical version of such a big exhibition since a while. Um, not my cup of tea, probably, but like in that sense of what it did, it was super interesting because it was bringing together all these voices of a, of this kind of like seemingly huge kind of like post internet generation. And then to look at it today, there's so many of these artists that are actually not working as artists anymore. Um, that just stopped, but it reflected so precisely on this time. And now we live like almost in a kind of Peter Meyer um, re neural where like you, you go back home to your studio, you lock yourself in and you paint <laughs> and read poetry and then you drink a cup of tea. Well, <laughs> it makes me think of also of uh, Maximiliano Gioni's Venice Biennale, which was this return to the haptic and this return to handmade objects and craft and outsider art. And it had this completely different take. I mean, this was also, I think, before. I think his Biennale was maybe 2013. Um, but of course, post-internet had been, you know, a really prevalent aesthetic for a very long time. And I, I, I'm trying to trace some thoughts together, but what I find, find interesting about the disc biennial is that it, it was very <coughs> sculptural. You know, they really, really worked through objects, like a lot of these artists, um, and also installations and, you know, billboards, for example. Um, and there wasn't a lot of painting. So it's it's interesting to think through how these things are connected, and especially with Ingrid's presentation. Um, and I, I just am reflecting back on what Bettina has said about how for her it's so clear that he's a painter in, in terms of how he fits into painting history. And, and that's also how I feel. And when I think about the speed in which with he worked, um, I also think about de Kooning, for example, and de-skilling and the idea of jamming and working with your left hand because you become too good at painting with your right hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, these kinds of games that painters play um, in order to kind of work through a certain vernacular. And um, yeah, I don't, it would be super <coughs> interesting to see what also he would think about the Berlin Biennale and how his work would fit into that visual language and what painting does in that kind of, uh, you know, rubric. Yeah, but it's interesting, like, I think it's also like a, a lack of vocabulary that, that we have at hand to, to, to talk about it at some point, I sometimes feel. Like, as Corey said, like, when, when he worked, like, as a internet artist, the, the idea of internet artist and always, like, ah, it's something that happens on the screen and it's looking, it looks strange and then it's internet art and then museums, like adopted it and they showed it like in the basement <laughs> under the stairs in a dark corner <coughs> on a computer connected to the internet um, to the world um, like vocabulary in terms of like how you talk about the practice like Macheos coming from Luxembourg studying in beautiful Stuttgart and then coming to Berlin and suddenly Berlin is this kind of like the internet alive somehow everything hap happens at the same time. But like then you have the institution and the institution usually shows artists and their work, but also institutions are limited in this discourse and like try to like slowly, slowly kind of like extend their own vocabulary, slowly becoming something, something different. And I think it's, it's going somehow, uh, it should go like hand in hand that we kind of try to extend our own, at least as curators, extend our own vocabulary of like understanding artistic practices in a wider context while everything else at the same time is developing further in some way. This is a difficult statement, also a question to myself. At a Sarah, can I briefly add to that? Um, I, I think that's a great thought you just um, s uh, shared. Um, and Maybe this also goes back to the question of the political, and I, I would say, for example, that the rave culture or the club culture in Berlin um, was pretty political, and maybe it was in these terms actually political in a sense that um, it it was really a broadening of like terms such as like painter or installation art or whatever, and maybe we should think of 
um, Mayers' work more in terms of environments than in ter like not as like single individual works or like discrete um, entities. Um, but more, you know, the way he painted in this like modular way, like making small parts that together they would form a big painting. And I think this, um, together with like the floor that makes a sound when you walk over it and so on and so forth, I think you should kind of think of this more in terms of environments, maybe. I think that is yet also uh, a very good wrap up. Are there questions from the audience? Nothing. <laughs> okay, before I say a very warm welcome to Sam Tonson, merci pour être ici. Um, thank you to all of you. Corey, for you, have a fantastic opening on Friday. I'm going to think of you. Thank you. Thank and you, everybody. Thank you for this very interesting discussion and the wonderful talks. And maybe we stay here and I hand over to Madame Tanson. I have to catch a cab, I'm so sorry, but I have to go to the airport. <laughs> I take your seat. Thank you. Be, be part. Yes, I prefer that. Well, <laughs> then before you leave, thank you for having been here. Um, I, I just... Um, um, had the, the last 30 minutes, I think, of your talk that I, I could listen to, and it was really interesting. And I'm, I'm a little bit um, sorry that I, I did not uh, hear all of it because um, uh, I, uh, I even understood everything, <laughs> even if I'm not an expert, but just a minister of culture in Luxembourg. So, um, uh, first of all, thank you um, for being here. I, um, I think that it is a, a hard time. Uh, also for you as a family, um, because as you might know, uh, only um, um, four days ago we thought about the, a lot about the crash that has just happened 20 years ago. So I, um, as uh, someone close or family member, or friend of, of Michel Mageros, I, I imagine that it is a specifically hard time uh, for you now. So um, thank you for being here. Um, and supporting this uh, really precious uh, initiative. Um, but it is also a very um, relevant time to discuss this because from, from what I remember, um, Michel Magerus was mainly discovered of the, the larger, broader public in Luxembourg after the, the, the accident, after his death, when there was um, a lot more talk about him at that time. And he maybe has never had the recognition uh, that he has now here in Luxembourg. Um, so it is really great of you also, Bettina and the Mudam team, to organize this uh, symposium today in being part of this um, German initiative uh, of the Michel Magerus 2022. So uh, I think it's really important to have talks about Michel Magerus' work and uh, his relevance here in Luxembourg to also remember um, what um, important artist he has been and he still is and uh, remember that he comes from Luxembourg and uh, what perspectives this also gives to, to artists from Luxembourg. Then um, one last word um, because I, I have been to the, to the estate of Michel Magerus a, a few years ago and I was really impressed um, by the work that is done there. And it also really helps to understand for an, a non-professional <laughs> in the work of Michel Magerus. And I don't remember now who talked uh, about the, the notebooks uh, of Michel Magerus, but that really gave me a new perspective uh, of his work and the way he approached um, his artistic work. Um, and I was again then impressed by how contemporary his uh, work also is. So this just for my small perspective. Um, thank you, really, for being here and for, for putting this on the agenda. Thank you. Okay, uh, for me, a last word. Thank you again, the estate. 
Thank you again, the family. Thank you again, all speakers. Thank you again, Clementine Ijuel. You did a fantastic work on this. And uh, we're gonna have drinks at our bar. So you're all invited and we can continue the discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.